This is the Governor's Community Leaders Conference. Families, hope for the future. Partners, sustaining the safety net. A program of GIFT, the Governor's Initiative on Families Today. Now please welcome our hosts, the chairs of the GIFT Initiative, Governor Michael O. Levitt and Mrs. Jacqueline S. Levitt. Thank you, and welcome to this inaugural Community Leaders Conference. This is a unique opportunity for Mrs. Levitt and me, as well as our other guests, to be with you today. We welcome the more than 3,000 leaders from government and education, churches, law enforcement, and other professionals who are here interested in Utahns and their families. We're pleased to have those of you who are watching the proceedings from home join us as well. There are 33 groups of leaders, like the one here in the studio, that are gathered at meeting sites all over the state. These leaders know Utah's values and that they value their families. Today we're going to explore ways that we can enhance our efforts to support and strengthen the families of Utah. I'd like to introduce the two people largely responsible for this conference, our co-chairs, Elder Alexander B. Morrison, who is president of the Utah North Area of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and Sister Margot Kane, executive director of the Catholic Community Services of Utah. We appreciate your efforts and that all that you've done to bring us together today. And we'll hear from each of them later in this conference. But now I would like you to permit me to offer some explanation as to why we've asked you as community leaders to join with us today. Ours is a unique alliance. We each have separate roles and we serve under different authority, but we serve the same people. This is a world that has plentiful challenges, but limited resources. My message today is very simple. We must work together. This is a remarkable time to live in Utah. We have many challenges, but it is generally a time of great economic progress. I'd like to talk today about some of the things that I believe are serious threats to that progress, and I believe things that require our joint efforts. As many of you know, I'm a vocal advocate for technology. It's changing the way our world works. It will require that we all learn to use it. In fact, I believe that our nation's economic well-being may in many ways be dependent upon how we make this difficult transition from the era of industrialization to the information age. We're working hard, for example, to get every classroom in our state wired with the internet. Our children need to know how this powerful new tool works. And no one will go unaffected by the way this new tool is reshaping our world. Recently, for example, I introduced the Pioneer System for our schools and for research. This powerful new tool literally puts at the fingertips of our, in our homes and our libraries and our schools an entire library of periodicals. We're forming the Western Governors University, which is a, a new university that will harness the coursework available in 16 states and literally deliver it to our homes. It's changing the way we do commerce and the way we trade. It's changing our health care and the way we seek it. It's changing the way we get news. Recently, a Salt Lake newspaper reported that they had 500,000 hits on their website the last week before the election, changing the way we elect our officials. It's changing the way we communicate with email and other means. But there's a dark side to all this opportunity, pornography. I had a conversation recently with a man that, frankly, I'd consider to be a very good father. He told me this story. He said his seven-year-old son had some things on his mind. He said, Dad, I just can't quit thinking about it. Now, he assumed that it was a nightmare or some kind of scary movie that he'd seen. After a lot of persuasion and some coaxing, he told of horrible and ugly, hardcore pornography that he'd been exposed to. Father said, where did this come from? He said it was a nine-year-old neighbor, a trusted neighbor, a good family, a good boy. He'd seen it on the computer. How many times did you see it, he asked. Lots of times. Well, the father went to the parents of the nine-year-old. They were shocked. They were dismayed. They were sickened to think of these two little boys whose minds had been polluted at that tender age. The parents of the nine-year-old confronted the boy. He collapsed in tears. He said, I, I know it's wrong, but I just keep looking at it. This is an addictive, sinister thing. 
Now, they were, of course, concerned that there might be an adult involved. But no, it was introduced to the nine-year-old by a sixth grader who gave him the internet address at school and said, look at this, it's really cool. Now, let's spread around that neighborhood like a plague. Now, the father told me that they'd encourage their children, as rightly they should, to learn to use the computer, and that the nine-year-old was good at it. But they kept the computer downstairs behind a closed door. Unwittingly, they had turned that room into a porn shop. Well, what should be done about this? This is a marvelous new tool. It's created new and political uh, and policy questions that frankly will likely take us years to resolve. What should government's role be? Should we take a role in protecting the children from this type of injury? In my opinion, yes. But what that role should be is still unknown. As we speak, the Supreme Court of the United States is wrestling with a major case that could define what the tools are that we have to protect ourselves. This question will go on for decades and it'll become one of great political and cultural battleground. But none of us can afford to stand clear of it. Now, there are two things that we know at this point absolutely clearly. First, these technological tools are going to be part of, of our lives in the future. Second, we simply cannot allow uh, uh, place government to be alone in sheltering us from this potentially devastating uh, tool. Government, schools, churches, community organizations, neighbors, and the media all share in, a, in the need to have a heightened vigilance to protect our community. Now, I've used the word community. We don't really protect a community. Actually, we protect individuals. The strength of a nation isn't measured in the size of its government or its strength, but by the goodness of its people. And that's measured one person at a time. Now today I'm asking each of us to join together in warning and educating our people about the simple things that can be done to make this world of information uh, technology the useful tool that it can be, and at the same time inoculate our families and our neighbors against ins its insidious dark side. Now, I'd like to report to you that our schools are taking every precaution. We're taking this very seriously. Each school has to have an acceptability policy before it can be connected to the internet. Each student has to sign an acceptable use agreement before the internet can be used. The agreement forbids students from accepting inappropriate sites. Now, teachers also are instructed to monitor and supervise the students as they, as they use that technology. Districts are using filtering software. Now, filtering software allows them basically to look for the sites that are in, inappropriate but no filter is perfect. Just let me give you a, a sense of how big a challenge this is. Six months ago, we had one million access requests on the internet in our public schools. One month, or six months later rather, it's eight million. Eight times growth in six months. Now I would ask that our community groups use this as an example of the way we can work together. Let us work together to teach parents how to protect their homes. Simple things make a big difference. For example, simply being aware. Good children from good homes can be affected. No closed doors. Uh, if the computer's on, have the door open. Talk with our children about the problems openly. It's so easy. All they have to do is type in three letters into a search engine, X, S, E, X, and the world of pornography is opened up to them. Now there are parental controls that can be used on the, on the internet. Things build into the software, filtering devices. If you don't know how to get them, you could call the Utah Education Network, go to your local school, they're learning about them, or call the governor's office and we'd be happy to provide you with information that we've assessed as to how that can be done. Most of all, let's look around us in our community and find people who can help us teach how to, how to protect ourselves. Now this year, we authorized over a thousand new spaces in our state prison system. Nearly 40% of those spaces will be filled up with those committing sex crimes. Do I think that that little seven-year-old and nine-year-old who were caught in the snare of pornography will commit sex crimes? No, I don't. They have parents who are on the case and they're working hard to protect them and to work through this problem. But there are many who aren't that lucky. It doesn't have to be very many to change the nature 
of a great place to live. Utah is a great place, and working together, we can keep it that way. Thank you. We believe these practices will help families in Utah who need a little extra strength by reinforcing the safety net of a caring community. Strong communities and strong families are so closely intertwined. I am impressed with the power of community. We are able to accomplish so much more by cooperation than we can singly. That is true of this combined audience assembled throughout our state today and it's true in our homes as well. I guess in my fervor as a parent to teach our children, I might overdo it occasionally. Two weeks ago on a Saturday morning, I had one of those moments. The scout leader had given our junior high son a sack of flyers to be delivered to homes. Well, he didn't greet the job with enthusiasm. I'd already used my patience trying to motivate other children to do their responsibilities that day, so I immediately began a lecture about service. Chase, do those flyers. You need to give back. Did you invent electricity that keeps you warm in this home? Did you fight the Revolutionary War to gain your freedom? Did you walk across the plains to help settle this state? He gave me a bewildered look and replied, Mom, I'm only 13. <laughs> Sometimes we can't overdo it. This particular gathering is very significant because both government and religious leaders are directly concerned with the morality and civic virtue of our people. The moral goals desired by our state are essentially those sought and upheld by our churches. I am troubled that we seem to have excused ourselves from openly honoring those values upon which our nation was founded. It shows up in social mores that seem to say it isn't polite to talk about religious beliefs in public. The founders of this country didn't intend for the Constitution to abolish talking about religion or religious values. John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and George Washington, and many others in our nation's history talked and wrote often of God, religion, and divine inspiration. We all read the same headlines, and it would be few who would deny a concern for our increasing social problems and a decline in our values and moral citizenship. It takes only a quick review of world history to see that a society that maintains high moral values prospers, and a society where the moral values disappear rapidly declines. It is important to recognize that from the beginning of American history, religions and religious believers have played a central role in shaping policy. The separation of church and state was never meant to keep religious leaders or beliefs from influencing public life. There are many benefits from working together today and in the future. Free exercise and democratic principles protect the right of religious views to be a part of our public debate. Politics and government in America over the years has clearly benefited from the moral leadership and values of many religious convictions. Last November, the U.S. Catholic Conference stated, We hope American Catholics will use the resources of our faith and the opportunities of this democracy to shape a society where more which is more respectful of life, dignity, and the rights of humans. In the February 22nd edition of the Deseret News, Rabbi Wenger encouraged people to advocate for their beliefs. Meaningful faith has something to say in the role of policy. People of faith and faith communities who advocate what they believe is just policy. And so I hope today our discussion will be both open and rich. I will close with the thoughts of George Washington from his farewell address as he left office. Religion and morality are indispensable supports of political prosperity. National morality can only continue if religious principles exist. By working together, our community and religious leaders will be able to help preserve our country and its liberty. Now let's get into the heart of our discussion. Elder Morrison has some comments and he'll introduce our keynote speaker. 
Thank you, Governor and Mrs. Levitt. Thank you for your thoughtful introduction to this conference, this first ever Governor's Conference for Community Leaders, focusing on the family. This is one of three family conferences sponsored by the Governor during 1997. This particular conference is aimed squarely at community leaders to encourage them to band together, to help one another, to share resources, and to form a united team in supporting parents and children as they build stronger families. Although the idea of conferences on the family was the brainchild of previous governors, Governor and Mrs. Levitt have certainly carried on and expanded the concept. This particular conference, for example, was originally intended for the clergy of the state, but has been enlarged to include other community leaders because we know the clergy cannot do it alone. Strong families form the foundation of our society in this state, and no one has, art has articulated this better than Governor and Mrs. Levitt. We thank them for this. As the governor mentioned, there are 33 groups of community leaders scattered throughout the state, from Logan on the north to Kanab on the south, and from Wendover and St. George on the west to Vernal and Monticello and Moab on the east, all gathered together to view this television program and then to see how they can work together in their own local communities to bring together their resources to help parents and children strengthen their family ties. Indeed, the purpose of this conference can be summarized in those three words, local, together, and resources. First, local. Local leaders know local problems best. Concerns vary from community to community. Each community has its own set of problems which can best be dealt with by people applying local solutions. Second, together. We must combine our ideas and efforts. We must work together and assist each other in our common goals. Whether we're mayors, judges, policemen, or teachers, Catholics, Latter-day Saints, Baptists, Episcopalians, or whatever. Whether we're Democrats or Republicans, Rotarians or Kiwanians or JCs, rich or poor, we all need and want stronger and happier families. That is the unifying force of all humankind. And because it is, shouldn't we be combining our best efforts to make our families stronger, more productive, more happy? Third, resources. Each organization in our communities has resources which others might not have. The state of Utah, through its various departments, has committed millions of dollars to provide professional help to communities. Churches and other organizations have developed materials and helps. Many community leaders may not know fully what's available or even what's lacking. Here's our chance to share ideas, to share resources, to share possible solutions with one another so that all of us have the tools and resources to work with our families. That's what this conference is all about. Local people working together to share resources. And now let me introduce our speaker today, Dr. Stephen R. Covey. Dr. Covey is founder and chairman of Covey Leadership Center, an internationally known organization which teaches its clients to live by principles. For more than 25 years, he's taught millions of people in business, government, and education that fundamental principles are rooted in unchanging natural laws of human behavior. Dr. Covey holds an MBA degree from Harvard and a doctorate from Brigham Young University. He is the author of several books, including The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, the New York Times number one bestseller with more than 10 million copies sold in 28 languages in 70 countries. Other bestsellers are Principle-Centered Leadership and First Things First. The principles taught by Dr. Covey can be applied equally to business, communities, school systems, governments, families, hospital, groups, and all walks of our daily lives. That's why we're so pleased to know that he will share with us today those principles outlined in his forthcoming book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families. We challenge you to focus on the principles he will share with us today so that you can then explore the application of those principles in your own communities. Dr. Covey, thank you for sharing your ideas with us today. Thank you. Well, I'm thrilled to participate, and I hope you're ready to go to work. Uh, if you haven't uh, shaken the hand of your neighbor, take a moment to do so. If your neighbor is your spouse, give a little hug. <laughs> 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 
Let me first say how much I uh, appreciate participating in this effort and to uh, hear the governor and uh, Mrs. Levitt talk this way is very, very inspiring and to have also heard the governor talk about how Utah could literally become a model state. A model is seen and a mentor is also seen and felt. So I believe that our state, for a number of very unique reasons, could become a model state to this entire country in response to this great initiative, and also a mentoring state, so that we actually help transport this model and communicate this value system around the family to the entire country. Now my presentation will focus in three areas. There'll be three parts to it. Three is really my favorite number. I thought it was seven, but it's really three. <laughs> First, purpose. Purpose. Second, principles and processes. And third, practices. Now, to begin the first part, let me ask everyone, if you would, wherever you are, at any location, to take a moment and participate in an exercise. Close your eyes, and without any peeking, everybody point north. Don't peek. Okay, keep pointing. Now, everyone, open your eyes and see where people are pointing. <laughs> Does this bother you at all? <laughs> you see, most people point this way and you're this. How about you? <laughs> Who's right? How do we know? Now, wherever you are, let's go to those people who are, uh, we could call them experts. How many here are absolutely confident that you know which way is north? Raise your hands. <laughs> if you're absolutely confident. All right, if you're confident, stand up for a minute. Well, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Good, you've got a lot of help. That's right. I agree with the governor. All right. Now, everyone who's standing up, um, you keep your eyes closed. The rest of us will watch you. Okay, point north. <laughs> okay, open your eyes, see where people are pointing. Looks like we're all pointing in this direction, <laughs> except for this gentleman back here and in this direction. Does this shake your confidence at all, sir? <laughs> Not at all. Thank you. We're fortunate to kind of know where the mountains are in this state, and that helps us get to uh, figure out where we are and what the directions are. I frequently do this with large audiences, and the confusion is profound, even with the second group. And it shakes people up to realize, you know, how many people have a different sense of direction. Similarly, you can go to almost any organization, including families. Try it tonight if you want to have some fun. Go to your loved ones at, say, mealtime, or say, Sometime in the next 48 hours, try this. Just say, honey, children, what is the purpose of our family? And just see what they say. Put it in just a few words, what is the purpose of our family? You'll be amazed, I do this all the time with major organizations, how confusing the responses are. There's one thing that unites us at this conference. More than perhaps any other thing, the highest value we all hold, that is our children. And the kind of story that the governor talked about is so repulsive and repugnant 
to our sense of decency and virtue to imagine this kind of thing happening in our public life today that you can almost not want to talk about it you'd like to almost avoid it but the unity that can come from a common purpose that unites us is tremendous I attended with a number of others a conference called pornography religious religions united against pornography and it had many many different faiths leaders ethnic leaders women leaders women's groups leaders and so forth over a period of about two days you could just feel the movement of that group from focusing or thinking underneath about the things that divide to coming together on the things that unite that's what we need to do to have a common transcendent purpose and goal to literally make this state a model and a mentoring state in our country now let's look at what's happening inside the culture in fact I better first find out which way north is I have my compass up here which way Elder Morrison it's the red indicator <laughs> all right <laughs> how many got it <laughs> but you'll notice on this compass I'll turn it so the camera can see it there is the indicator there is the indicator but there is also another arrow and in compass language this arrow is called the direction of travel in other words people's behavior what they actually do their habits and what the social culture is like the social mores the social norms now as Mrs. Levitt was talking about some of these great founding principles of our country and how morality underlay almost everything to maintain our economic our political our social institutions in a sense it involves taking this compass and aligning that culture with north like that now there's an alignment see look at that it's perfect alignment this is misalignment the sense of which way north is never changes what changes is the culture for instance one of the powerful cultural tendencies we have today is to focus upon crises we only move usually to get enough social will to drive the political will at the time of a crisis this pornography and the internet is a crisis and the whole country is getting alarmed about it but what if there wasn't the work the preparation work done at the family level on an inside out basis to fortify and to give awareness like the governor said understanding of what is happening and to involve people in the process so that little by little you begin to move the culture to be in alignment with this direction this purpose of focusing upon our children our families and our communities the support system which surrounds it and lest that happen lest that happens all of civilization literally is in peril how many of you crammed when you were in school how many got pretty good at it how many have ever worked on a farm did you ever cram on the farm can you imagine that forgetting to plant in the spring flaking off all summer then hitting it real hard in the fall see yet it worked in school but not on the farm now why see school is a social system farm is a natural system you have to align behavior the culture with the principles or it will never happen how many would agree that you can get 
a degree and not get an education. <laughs> because we're manipulating the rules in a social system. Take health care, major issue today. If we were serious about health care, what would we primarily focus on? Prevention. Yeah, prevention, meaning what? Aligning what? Behavior, our personal practices and habits with what? The laws of health, of wellness. But society has assigned to the medical community, basically, and the medicine has responded to primarily, almost exclusively, like 98% of the budget, on the diagnosis and prevention of disease. Henry David Thoreau said, for every thousand hacking at the leaves of evil, there is one striking at the root. The family is the root. Family is the goose that lays the golden egg to everything. You all know Aesop's fable. He found his, his uh, favorite goose and he's starving, is impoverished, and he sees next to it a golden egg. He's thrilled to death. And he takes that uh, golden egg and thinks at first it's bogus, and then he tests it and finds out it's pure gold. And he, you know, he becomes wealthy almost instantaneously, and he gets another one, and another one, the next day, the next day. But he gets very, very impatient. He wants them all, and he wants them now. So he kills the goose to reach inside its stomach and get all of the eggs at once. Ends up with none of them. See, that's why the family is the building block and the glue of all communities, of all societies, everything. That's why the building of a culture that will support family and protect children and help them become responsible, moral, contributing citizens is what this is about. But it takes a crisis often. One of the issues that was discussed in that conference was uh, mothers against drunk driving and the approach they took which, uh, which alarmed so much of this nation that it literally helped move the social will against drunk driving. Literally. In other words, the culture was changed. You had an alignment of the culture with the purpose and the principle. That was a tremendous effort and a great model, a great example. If you can get enough people alarmed and sensitive and aware of really what is happening, you can begin to shift that culture. It doesn't come by mandating it. And it takes social will to drive the political will. You can't really get sustained political will without social will behind it. And unless the value system of the larger community, the critical mass, drives the social will, you will not get the political will to make it happen. You could take any major problem in our society today through the same very little analysis. Fundamentally, it comes down to aligning with north, aligning with, I'm using that as a metaphor and as a symbol, with the principles of north that are universal, universal. They apply in any country, any culture, any religion, and that are timeless, they never change, and also that are self-evident. The way you can tell a principle is self-evident is to try to argue for its opposite. And when you can see that's totally foolish, then you know you've got a self-evident principle that is not controversial. And we've got a self-evident value here, our children, our families, and fundamental principles that are universal and timeless and self-evident. Now, what are those principles? It's part two. What are those principles? Let me share three of them with you. How do you get a culture to change? So it aligns itself and isn't so focused on crisis and on independency rather than interdependency, this togetherness idea, and that it focuses upon the use of the technologies 
to create more than models who are essentially from the entertainment and the athletic world for our children. Here are three principles. First, when you live the laws of love, you encourage obedience to the laws of life. Second, involve people in the problem and work out solutions together. Third, work from the inside out. I had a good friend of mine who said to me, Stephen, I am heartsick about my relationship with my son. It's really sour, and, and he seems to not care. And it's just like a metastasizing cancer inside the family. What can I do? At that time, I was doing a lot of teaching on the subject of empathic listening. I was teaching a course on it. I said, why don't you come into the course and learn how to listen to your boy from within your boy's frame of reference? And it was about four-week focus on that one basic skill. See, most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. They're always listening from within their frame of reference, even though they might, mm-hmm, yeah, oh, yeah. You know, they have the listening posture, but their mind really is preparing their response. Well, he came to the class, and he thought he got the point very, very rapidly. So he went to his son, uh, and he said, Son, uh, I would like to visit. I'd like to talk if we can. The son said, There's nothing to talk about. He stood up and walked out. The father said to me, This un ingrate, I mean, I can't believe this. All the preparation I'd made for that little kind overture, and he just walks out. I said, he's testing your sincerity. And what did he find out? See, you don't really want to listen to your son. You want your son to shape up. And you want to use a listening technique as a means to shape him up. Until you value your son more than you value your purpose with your son, he's not going to be open to it. And to show that value, you've got to demonstrate you understand him from within his frame of reference. He said, he should shape up that whippersnapper. He knows full well what he's doing. I said, look at the, look at the amount of anger. Look at what's happening inside you. You've got a lot of work you need to do. A lot of work inside yourself. Come back to the class. You can't force natural processes. We've got to learn this until it's deep within. Well, he cared enough about the whole situation and his son, he came back. After he concluded, he came to me and he said, I think I'm now prepared. I said, he's going to test your sincerity. He said, I'm prepared. No matter what he does, even if he rejects you and your good intentions, he said, yeah, no matter what. He went to the boy and he said, I really would like to talk. I know you don't want to, but it's probably because I haven't listened to you and that you feel like I don't understand. Oh, say, you don't understand. <laughs> you have never listened to me. He stood up and walked out again. Just as he got to the door, um, the father said to him, before you leave, I do want to say to you, I'm sorry for the way I embarrassed you in front of your friends the other night. The boy whipped around, teared up, and said, do you have any idea how embarrassing that was? And the father said to me, when I saw those tears in his eyes, I knew the boy cared. And Stephen, he said, you have no idea how much I wanted to understand. 
all the training you'd given did not motivate me like those tears. The awareness of how tender and how vulnerable this boy is. And they talked. He basically said, that was very, very disturbing to you. Oh, and he went on to describe it. And the more he talked, the more he opened up, and the more the father genuinely began to see, in a sense, how his boy saw the world. The magic of, of love, true primary love began to take place. Both of them were being changed. Both of them were being transformed. It was no longer some manipulative technique called empathic listening. He really knew he didn't understand, and he wanted to. And they talked till late. The mother came in and said, it's time for bed. And the boy said, Mom, Dad and I are talking. We want to talk, don't we, Dad? They talked until the wee hours. And the next day, in my office building, my faculty colleague said to me, with tears in his eyes, I found my son again last night. Now what happened was, and this is such a foundational principle, until people feel intrinsically valued, unconditionally loved, treasured, in their own right, apart from their behavior, and apart from your intentions and your teachings, they are not open. They are not that influenceable. I borrow your glasses for a second, Terry. You've liked these. They've helped you, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> we think they'll also help you, Pat. <laughs> no. <laughs> no? <laughs> Try harder, son. <laughs> Try harder, daughter. I'm working on it. <laughs> You've no. got to think positively. Really. If I close my eyes. Son, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with this program that a positive attitude can't correct. <laughs> Are those tears of gratitude? <laughs> no. <laughs> they look good on you, don't they? They do. They look wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> you can, Pat can't see me. <laughs> no, I can't. Now notice the methods of influence I'm trying to use. See, I'm convinced I'm right, and she needs this. <sighs> How current is your resume, employee? <laughs> you going to be part of this team? Not this team. <laughs> Look, when I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. <laughs> Daughter, do you have any idea the sacrifices that your mother and I have made for you in your life? The years and years of preparation and caring that we've given to you, and this is the attitude you're going to take? You like them now, honey? <laughs> that help a lot? <laughs> You see, the only reason why, excuse me, why, <laughs> how's the headache? At least I can see. Want some aspirin? <laughs> the only reason why Terry wears these glasses is that the optometrist first diagnosed and then built the prescription on the diagnosis. The optometrist did not come to her with a pre a prejudiced, prejudged position on the prescription that came from within Terry and her unique eye situation. Then the whole prescription was based on it. That's what got her confidence. The whole key to human influence is first be influenced. Always first understand before you seek to be understood. That's why she wears these glasses. And that's why you won't, in spite of economic pressure, social pressure, vanity, PMA language, think positively. 
pressure on your behavior, it will not take. Similarly, every situation is so unique, it's very much like her eye situation. You cannot generalize, and this is why it takes a lot of personal security to go with an openness to listen, to understand, and then to involve the person in the problem and work out the solution together. Thank you. I'm this way. <laughs> I sometimes call this the emotional bank account. It's like, a, it's like a financial bank account into which you make deposits. Reverend Jackson, if I build an emotional bank account with him, he knows that I will come through. I will keep my commitments. He knows that I will tell it as it is. I won't pull punches, manipulate. He also knows I won't talk to other people about him behind his back. <laughs> do you know what happened? Because you know full well, the moment I do that, I would do the same thing with you. All it would take is a stress on our relationship. This is what builds the security within. It's your integrity when you're alone, when you're in the dark, when you have power, when you're with people that, that you don't have to impress. See, when you have this, then you can afford the risk of being open and listening to another person. Really listening and being open and not knowing what's going to happen. And that's the key to human influence. That's the key to the culture change, is deep involvement at the local level together with everyone listening to everyone respectfully with a common purpose. In fact, they need to do that to develop that common purpose. And our common purpose is the preservation of the goose, the health and welfare of the families, and the support system in the community behind particularly those families that are at risk and those children that are at risk and that have terrible modeling that is taking place. You see, if you assume you know, there's an arrogance there that will keep other people protected from you. If you assume I have a part of the truth, but he has a part of the truth, and she has a part of the truth, and he does, and I don't know what the truth is for them. I have to be open and to listen. I have to have a lot of internal <laughs> security so I can afford the risks of this listening. But the more you sense genuineness and sincerity and integrity in the effort, the emotional bank account builds up like a financial bank account. You see, the first deposit in the emotional bank account is always to understand, because you don't know what a deposit is to another person. We assume we do. We project out of our own home movies, out of our own autobiographical experiences, onto other people what they're thinking. We don't know. We have to assume that. That's why humility is the mother of all virtues. It basically says, I have reverence for you. You are different. And that is valuable. You, too, have a piece of the truth. I'm going to show you a little vignette of a culture that has achieved this to some degree. It's not perfect. It's a third world nation. It's an independent nation state. It's the oldest democracy in Africa. Five different cultures, five different religions, strong ethnic convictions. But you know what their transcendent purpose is? The same one we have today. Their children, their families, and their economic survival. They're struggling to move into the first world. And uh, it's hard. They're really struggling, but they work together. And you know what the transcendent purpose is? Their future of their families. And the synergy is the highest value. What does synergy mean? The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. These two hands can do five times as much work because they're connected to the, by the part between them. 
than if they were separated and you added up the total of what each could produce. You have two ears. You can tell direction. You couldn't tell direction with one ear. Or if you had two ears not connected. The key is in the connection. The key is in the part. That's what enables a husband and wife to produce children. The valuing of the differences, the synergy, is what enables creation to take place. And it's the creation that creates the bonding. And it's the bonding that is the immune system that you want in your marriage, you want in your family, you want in your community, so that the next major onslaughting kind of back-ending attack, like, what, like the story the governor told us today, it can handle it because there is a cohesiveness. Now, I want you to observe these three principles as you watch this little film because they're all in operation. First principle, first principle, remember, is the primary laws of love encourages obedience to the primary laws of life. You try to get focus on the primary laws of life before you have the relationship, it won't happen. Second principle, involve people in the problem so that they become part of the solution. Work out the solution together. And the third principle, inside out. Everyone takes responsibility. You don't wait for the outside to make it happen. You don't sit and say, I wonder what they're going to do. I'll wait and see what they're going to do. You know what those people are doing there? You get out of that whole victim mentality, out of that irresponsible attitude of transferring responsibility to government, to leaders, to other people, to teachers, to anyone. See, you get your head out of that. This society has almost no crime. They don't even carry guns. It's 1.3 million people on a little island 2,000 miles east of South Africa in the Indian Ocean. This society has 100% employment, 98% literacy. I heard a presentation the other day in Buenos Aires who said, in developing nations, you cannot have rational economic policies around the free market concept and maintain social values. You cannot do it. The reason is that there isn't the synergy, the morality, deeply enough into the mores and the norms of that society. Emil Durkheim put it this way, when mores are sufficient, laws are unnecessary. When mores are insufficient, laws are unenforceable. You could not enforce the laws a few years ago in East L.A. after that announcement on the Rodney King situation. You could not enforce the law. There were no mores. There was no social cohesion. How do you build that, see? This is a place called Mauritius. They so value each other's differences and a transcendent common purpose and the value of synergy that they actually celebrate each other's religious holidays. This is a 22-minute film, but I've cut it down because of our time limitation this morning to four minutes. So really look for these principles operating as you see an element of what we're talking about here and how literally Utah could become a model state.
Monsignor Margeau, who was the previous cardinal uh, in Mauritius, uh, made a very nice statement, which I think describes very well. He says that we should consider each group, uh, racial or cultural, as a fruit, an apple, a pear, a mango, and we want to make Mauritius not a marmalade where we mix up everything and grind everything and we have one marmalade with one I don't know what taste but we would like to have a fruit salad where in a fruit salad each one retains its individual flavor and taste. The differences add to the richness of the diversity, to the mosaic beauty of the nation. We, uh, we feel proud of our ancestry of our ancestral values. We just recognize the right of everyone to be different and that we live with these differences and sometimes we find them to be a source of enrichment. Do not forget that this island is the same as it was in the 16th, 17th century, far away outside the main currents of developed countries and nations, which means that to, for the survival of the country, you have given you have to give the very best of yourself. And this is ingrained in us, in every Mauritian. We had several disadvantages. We were far from any of the main markets, US or Europe, and we had no resources at all, no local raw material. In fact, we stated very clearly in our first plans that our only asset is our people. We had a sugar boom in 75, 76, which brought in the first prosperity to the country, and then um, sugar went down and that coincided also with the long-term um, aspects of the oil crisis. So the 1980s was a very tough time for Mauritius because such factories were not um, yet really solid. But everybody got down to work. And uh, the government said, well, we've, we've got to draw in our belts. And it happened, irrespective of what the communities was. It was either Mauritius survives or Mauritius doesn't survive. So you have this ethic as well that um, we're working for our children and uh, we've got to make things better. I have a very Anglo-Saxon upbringing, and, uh, which I think is also very American. And we have a confrontational system in, uh, in the West. I, two ideas confront, they fight it out, and that the best one wins. Now, what I've learned here, where the majority of the population is Asiatic, now, the Asiatics have a completely different way of looking at life. Their way of looking at it is you look at what your opponent, what his position is, and you try to get as close to his position as possible. We don't sort of uh, say anything calculated to offend the religious or cultural susceptibilities of any other group. And that is a cardinal principle of living here and people would never deliberately or accidentally offend. In Mauritius, I think, after all the struggle that we have gone through, we have been able to understand that there's nothing better than understanding, helping, sharing, and giving a hand to anybody who is next to you. Wish we wish we had time to see the rest of this because it's fascinating some of the specific things they do to accomplish this kind of synergy in this culture. Let's have an experience right here with this. Okay, now most of you have seen the pictures I'm going to show, but go ahead and see them again. I'm going to show one picture to this side of the room. So out there in the various sites, Break the room up to where the right side, looking forward, that would be my left, sees the first picture. The next picture is this side. And then I'll show a third picture to both sides. Okay? So this side here, close your eyes. And this side here, look at this picture. It's only going to be there for less than a second. Put it up, put it down. Okay, now this side of the room, open up your eyes. This side, please close your eyes. Okay, look at this picture for a second. Put it up, put it down. All right, now everybody look at this picture. Put it up, put it down. Okay, when you first saw this third picture, how many in this room thought 
that it was an older woman. Raise your hand. Raise your hand high. Look around the room, folks. How many thought it was a younger woman? Okay, most of the people on this side of the room saw the younger woman. Most of the people on this side of the room saw the older woman. It's because I conditioned you for only one split second, even though most of you have seen these pictures before. And it still splits the room in half. If you had a huge room, like a thousand people, and they had not seen them before, it would split it so clearly, it was amazing. You still have a few on the other side. I call those people neurotic. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> now, let me tell you what's happened. So we all have our own perspective of things, our own view. And that first conditioning experience, which lasted a split second, put into your mind a perception. Then you saw the next picture you saw through that perception. So you don't see the world as the way the world is, you see the world the way you are. That's why humility and reverence toward other people and toward differences and toward valuing the truth that everyone possesses is so vital. Well, let's watch you do this. Okay, we'll put the third picture up. Everybody do what you need to do by visiting with the people around you until you see both the older woman and the younger woman. Just talk to your neighbors until you all see it. Okay, who sees only the older woman? Raise your hand. Who sees only the younger woman? Only. Okay, would you two come up for a second? This gentleman and this gentleman. Okay, put this picture down for a second. I see, older, I see younger women and all older women. <laughs> okay. He just said, for the viewing audience that didn't hear that, I see... Younger women and all or older women. Okay. Now, um, you two need to interact with each other. Now, you can imagine this is a situation. You're a leader in the community, and you're interacting with other leaders on developing a program to find out the resources so that we can deal with this purpose we're about today. And there's a difference. So how do you deal with this difference? Now, watch how they deal with this difference. You two... Talk with each other. I'm going to stand over here and interpret what I see is happening here. Till you both see them both, okay? You can walk up to the screen, you can point, you can do whatever. Okay, put the picture up and I'll sit here and make observations. Now notice, same thing with you. They have humility enough, they have humility enough to listen to each other. They're not trying to convince, they're not trying to pressure. They're open to each other's influence. That is the key to human influence. That shows respect. It shows humility and reverence. The problem they're having, though, is they don't find a common point. If they would point to it and ask each other what their interpretation is, this thing may come together. Why don't you stand up close to it and point? <laughs> uh, normally, I would take maybe whatever time it took, but we are under a lot of time pressure this morning. As soon as you see them both, she still doesn't. Now this often happens, literally. People get so invested into their perception and they're not going to give it up. They get emotionally locked in. And that's what happens many in our, our efforts to influence people. So that the dynamic that causes the bonding does not take place. How's it coming? See them both? I can still only see the older woman. Only see the older woman? Yeah. Okay. Now, imagine this, my friend, is a necklace. Okay? Imagine that. It's a necklace. That, and this is the younger woman's cheek and chin line. Okay. See it now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you see them both? Yeah. You do for sure? No. You don't. 
You know, I, I hadn't focused on Okay, you, you see only the older. Okay, now imagine this is a mouth. Yeah. If that's a mouth, what's this? It's a nose. You got it? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay. I need some big, strong, husky person to come up here and arm wrestle me. Come on. I want you to know as you come up that I have never lost, and you are going down. Really? Yeah. Okay. And I've got a black belt, and yours is also black, but I've never lost. Mine's real. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> all right. Now, the reverend here is going to give you a dime if you put me down here, and he's going to give me a dime if I put you down here. Okay. okay? Now, and uh, keep track. Tell us when to start and keep track. Okay? You can borrow from all the people in the first rows. They're the deep pockets. Okay? If I lose, this is set up. Okay. Ready? All right. Now wait, and and you give us about. 20 seconds, and you count the number of times he puts me down or I put him down. Every time he puts me down or I do, we get another dime. Okay. Oh. <laughs> this is, this is me. <laughs> Let's both win. Oh. <laughs> I see. Now look at that. We're making a lot you of money. Counting it? <laughs> now look. I want my money now. <laughs> this is literally the tendency in all people. As soon as someone is starting to resist and try to win against you, you tend to push back. That which you resist persists. So don't push back. Put up the seven habits diagram as I describe this. I'm going through habits four, five, and six. Just put it up briefly for a moment and you'll see. Now notice, habit four, think win-win. Habit five, seek first to understand, then to be understood, and habit six, synergize. Now watch. Okay, you guys come back to this arm wrestle. Okay, I create a condition where he's thinking win-lose. You're going to go down. Mm -hmm. I'm, you had at it, didn't you? I knew I was going to win. <laughs> yeah, but you were going to win and I was going to lose. See, it's true. that's called win-lose. See, you're right. You're the father. You're the community leader. You're the church leader. I'm this little kid that thinks it's cool to see pornography and everything else, and that's my culture. Mm -hmm. So you think you're right, and I think it's cool and that I'm right. Okay, now, seek first to understand. That doesn't mean you go and watch porn. <laughs> seek first to understand. Always understand you. I've got to get your confidence. Then to be understood, let's both win. Now look, and now look effortless. Look how easy that is, see, back and forth. That can happen in a community. That can happen in a family. But it takes the willingness to think win-win, both of us, see, and to listen to the other first. Always seek the interest of the other first until they feel they can trust you. Then share how you see it, and you're usually able to come up with another alternative that is far superior. Okay, thank you. Put up the overhead on the slide on creating the third alternative. See, the third alternative is the spirit. The third alternative is the spirit of synergy that we want in this state and in our communities where the traditional process is not... No, that's the compromise. See, this is the traditional process. I listen to your proposal, you listen to mine, and then we go for the middle position. Here is the third alternative. This is the synergistic alternative. I understand your initial objectives and proposals. You understand mine. We listen to each other, and we come up with a solution that is better than either of the initial proposals. I have done this even in front of cameras on the toughest issues in our society, including environmental issues, abortion, almost any issue that arouses deep moral sentiment and feeling inside people. 
you basically say to them, and remember this as you work on this togetherness approach, because we're not talking about just interdependency inside a family. You community leaders, you're involved in creating a culture of interdependency between families. Because what about all those families that don't have good models? Where the kids are just terribly at risk. What about all the educators that need to be involved and the church leaders, the social leaders, everybody, see, to create this spirit of interdependence. But this is tough. You know why? You know what the highest value in our country is? It's freedom. It's individual expression. It's wanting to do what I want to do when I want to do it. That's a tremendous value. But if that is not balanced with responsibility and obligation and with a sense of interdependency, it is a disastrous value. That's why this concept of interdependency. So do something like this in these community meetings. And you might even practice it today in your discussions with each other because inevitably there'll be different points of view. But always say to yourself, they see it differently. Good, I don't understand. I want to understand. Okay, here's what you do. Here's habit four. You think always. Mutual respect. Habit five. Let me listen to you first, and don't make your point until you can restate their point to their satisfaction. Then, as you do that, it's like giving someone emotional oxygen. If we were to take the air out, no one would want to listen to any of this. Now that you have air, air doesn't motivate you. When you give someone emotional oxygen and they feel validated, not agreed with at all, just understood, valued, confirmed and affirmed as a valuable person. When that happens, they don't seek air. Now they're open to the other person. Not always. There could be a number of other factors that are more dynamic than what's taking place between the two of us. Deep psychic scarring, a lot of other social forces. So you can't generalize on this. But generally, <laughs> Generally speaking, <laughs> you will find this happening. And that is, people will find a third alternative that is better. So say something like this to the two people. Why don't we agree to look for a solution that is better than what either of us brought to this situation? Would you be willing to do that? Well, I don't know what it would be. I mean, I mean, this is a moral issue to me. I know. I don't know what it would be either. Would you be willing to search for it? Well, I guess. Let me listen to you first. Remember that language. Let me listen to you first. Let me try to understand first. Now, what I hear you saying is, is correct me if I'm wrong. Do you feel like I do understand? Now, could I ask you to also try to understand me? In a control-oriented, efficient society, an effort to listen empathically is often perceived as a form of agreement. So you have to make it very, very explicit what you're doing. I'm only trying to understand. Then I'd like to ask you to try to understand me. That's when the dynamic happens of human influence. That's what causes the bonding. That's what transforms the people involved. It really does. And they start to get creative, and they start going for better and better solutions. What kind of solutions? I recommend these three basic activities to be encouraged throughout our entire state, all of our communities, because it is so fundamental. First, to develop a family mission statement, a sense of purpose. What is our family about? And what is our value system? What do we really believe and want to live by? Second, to have special family times scheduled regularly. To hold meal times as sacred so that the table is an altar, as it were. To have special family outings, family nights, family meetings where you can discuss values and plan and solve problems and show how synergy can create this immune system. And third, and it's just as important as the other two, have frequent one-on-one -on -one visits, dates with your spouse, 
with each child regularly. And you get excited about that thing coming up. I took my daughter one time on a business trip. I did business work and speaking throughout the day. And then the client, very prestigious client, and the head of that operation said to me, we'd like to have you come to dinner with us. And I said, you know, I took my daughter on here because we're going to have a special date together. But that's kind. Thank you for the invitation. He said, oh, she's welcome to come. I could see her over there watching this, knowing that was the end of her special private date. And I said to him, you know, we've looked forward to going, this is in San Francisco, we're going to go into Chinatown, and then we are going to do this, and let's go back to the hotel, have room service. We're just going to have a ball together. We're so looking forward to this. I'm sure you can understand. He said, oh, I wish I'd said that more times. In fact, I had one of them say to me, I don't know if I'm going to go for the number one job. I don't know if it's worth the price. He said, uh, I feel like I've lost my relationship with my children during their childhood. I was so active, so busy, so involved in so many things. And they feel the same way. And I'm perhaps going to, this was a multinational, multi-billion organization. I probably will be asked to be the head of this. He said, I don't know if I will. But let me show you what's exciting. He pulls out from underneath his, his table. We were in Los Angeles airport eating together and pulled it out. And he said, this is what excites me. He was showing a home that he and his kids and their kids were developing together. And this is the way he was going to reclaim a lot of that lost childhood. See, that's what becomes supremely important is the cultivation of this relationship on a one-on-one -on -one basis. The anticipation of the date, literally, will be as satisfying as the realization. You can get excited about it. Special times to take your child to breakfast. You go out to breakfast, maybe go to McDonald's or wherever you want to go. A special time when we together can do this. What would you like to do? You write the agenda. In fact, my kids I have taken some of these trips would say, I've done too much homework in hotel rooms. Why? I was trying to be efficient, see? <laughs> I was trying to kill two birds with one stone. No, let them write the agenda. Dag Hammarskjöld put it this way, it is more noble to give yourself completely to one individual than to labor diligently for the salvation of the masses. Why? It impacts the character more profoundly to give yourself completely to one. I am yours. I am with you, see? than to continue to do all this great work for all of the people out there. And the interesting thing is that that one is the key to the many because it so impacts the character that is manifested toward everybody. Those are three practices I suggest. Again, the writing of a family mission statement. Put up the family mission statement, the three elements I suggest that it contains. A sense of what your purpose is. First, a sense of what your values are based upon principles. Second, and a sense of vision. Sandra and I envision our 50th winter anniversary. And we see what the feeling is and what those people are involved. See, many, many families are struggling for survival. Other families have survival, but they're struggling for stability. Other families have stability and they're struggling for success, the achievement of goals. But the highest level is to have a movement from success to significance, to where the focus in the family transcends the family. It's to serve, it's to contribute, it's to be involved in an effort like we're talking about today. One of my heroes today is Nelson Mandela. I met him, I met the clerk as well. I also admire enormously Gandhi. I was with his grandson the other day. He gave me his, his book on his grandfather. These men have moral authority. Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison, he's elected the president of his country. He comes out and at the front row at his presidential inauguration are his jailers, his warders, 
and his loved ones. Look at the spirit of that man. That's the spirit of, rec of reconciliation, of unity, of forgiveness, of love. That's what gives moral authority. That's what enables both social and economic values to go up. Because of the third alternative, like Lord Moulton, a parliamentarian in the Middle Ages, called it the law of the unenforceable. That's where the culture is. And that's the opportunity we have to influence that because the key element is our leadership. Critical mass, in my judgment, is only 20%. It's not 60, not 80. Organized people who care and are committed. You community leaders are in that position. On the rudder of every boat and plane, though they're called different technical terms, is a little trim tab. And the key to turning the rudder is to turn the trim tab. In your personal mission statements and in your family mission statements, I suggest you include the concept of being a trim tab person. That makes you a transition figure where you stop the transmission of bad stuff from going into the next generation. That to me is exciting. In the words of Gandhi, I'll close. We must become the change we seek in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Covey. That was a remarkable presentation. He is a great ambassador of our state, and he is an ambassador of common sense that spread around the world. Now it's time for all of us as community leaders to go to work. It's time to take excellent ideas presented, that were presented here and discuss how we can apply them uh, to our efforts to strengthen families. Sister Margot Kane has instructions on what we'll do next. Sister Margot? Thank you, Governor Levitt, and thank you, Dr. Covey, for your presentation. You have given us a very fine base for which the task we set for our discussions. Time will be a critical factor as we seek to bring your message into our local communities and identify the opportunities we have in communities in partnerships to strengthen the safety net for families and individuals in need. Now I have some directions for the 33 groups of leaders gathered at local sites around the state. Each local moderator has the outline and the format for the discussion, which should run from 10.30 until noon. The local discussions will be divided into two 45-minute sections. The first portion will begin with comments from a panel of local community members building on Dr. Covey's presentation. The remaining portion of the first 45 minute period will be devoted to discussion of how your particular community utilizes resources, persons and groups in serving families and individuals who need assistance from the community, persons, clergies, agencies and service organizations. What is working well for your community now? And how can your response be more effective? A recorder will be taking notes of the key points of your discussion. A second 45 minute portion of your time will utilize the input of your discussion to formulate concrete recommendations as to what could be the next action steps the group may decide to take to carry the community resource network forward, to expand, strengthen, and coordinate the resource network in a more effective and timely ways. The moderators will coordinate the discussion and will ask that you limit your recommendations to two or three practical action steps. We hope that each local group will continue this discussion by choosing someone to bring you together to continue sharing resources and building families. 
In just a minute, we'll pass the baton to you. It is the hope of this conference that efforts at the local level can continue the development of your community to be, in Dr. Covey's words, a more effective family and hopefully an extended family which embraces all individuals, families, churches, and groups who can participate as providers and beneficiaries of community resources and thereby enable your community to build a better tomorrow with confidence and an abiding sense of hope and vision. In the months ahead, as we work together in our communities, periodically we should ask ourselves, how are our children? Thank you, Sister Margo, and thanks to each of you who brought this conference together and worked so hard to make it happen. And now as community leaders convene in their discussion groups, Jackie and I want to let you know how much we appreciate the work that you do in each of your positions in our community to keep families safe and to keep them strong. And we hope that because you work together here in Utah, and that your individual communities will even be better as a place to live and to raise families. We can solve the problems of our state and move forward keeping it a great place. Good luck and God bless you all.